that um, congratulate Sean Lynch, M Melissa Rothman, and uh, all the other folks who contributed to this incredible issue. It's it's so beautiful. Um, uh, there's an image inside. All the images are, are spectacular. Um, and I hope that all of you will take one home. Um, Sean's done an incredible uh, job uh, getting this together. And I want to thank Elise, Alexis for suggesting the idea. I just know that um, in growing up, one of the first things that my late mother told me um, her children was that we were part Indian and if you do the research a lot of African Americans when we escaped from those plantations we were taken in by certain native tribes um, although the irony is that my ancestry is Cherokee I mean I'm, I'm one one-eighth Cherokee the same fraction that the great Cherokee leader John Ross was. He was one-eighth Cherokee and Irish. Um, but I grew up with that knowledge and whenever I would go to the library I would always go to the books that had to do with Native American people although they were just called Indians then. But as I grew and as I matured and developed throughout my life I began to see intersections between my African ancestry and my Native American ancestry. And sometimes the things that were shown to me in terms of in my dreams um, were so powerful that I asked that, uh, you know, that the power be turned down a little bit until I was mature enough to handle what I was seeing. Um, and it's true, um, the issue Sean mentioned earlier about the Cherokee in Oklahoma trying to expunge all the Cherokee off the rolls, off the rolls um, who had African ancestry, because it comes down to money and the casinos and the money made from the casinos. And there are certain African American legislators in Oklahoma who have told these particular Cherokee that um, if they continue with this particular activity that they would make sure that they did not get a license to have a casino. So I have to dip back into that and find out where the, where the struggle stands now. Um, and then the other irony is that the Cherokee, some of the Cherokee fought on the side of the uh, of the Confederates. Um, so that's another story. Um, I'm going to begin by reading, and I want to say to the young man that just left here, you know, thank you for your work. Your words are very powerful, and I would like to get one of those books from you tonight. Thank you very much for that. We have to all worry about Donald Trump. Becoming the I'm leaving the country if he gets elected, man. <laughs> yeah, if he gets elected. But I don't know where I'm going to go. He'll send assassins to places like this. Yeah, right. Um, I'd like to dedicate this poem to a friend of mine that's in the audience, and we go back a long way. And he hates to hear me say this, but this is the man who walked up to me on April 4th, 1968, and told me that they had assassinated Martin Luther King and we were both students at Temple University. And when I got back from the war, um, we reconnected, and um, I began to make trips to the home of his wife, which was uh, St. Thomas Virgin Islands, the American Virgin Islands. And I wrote this poem, it's called American Paradise, based on an experience I had in St. Thomas. American Paradise. In the center of Charlotte Amali, down St. Thomas's way, the people sell their wares under a canopy of steel. The place they change their fish and meat, greens and yams, is crowded with auction blocks 
where babies cried, mothers sighed and screamed, and blood tattooed black flesh in patterns of pain. Africans, salted like a side of beef, moaned and groaned, shouted in defiance of the whips and chains and slavers' ice blue eyes. Oh, this was the place, now called an American paradise, where our ancestors came ashore to a nightmare. The only jazz they heard was the crack of whips against black hips. The only sound around was the terror of their grief that was louder than any Caribbean reef. Oh, grief, we own it. Oh, terror, we own it. Oh, pain, we own it. Oh, anguish, we own it. Oh, sorrow, we own it. Oh, faith, we own it. Surrounded by warehouses packed with human flesh, the slavers' voices assaulted the air. How much for this here heathen, big in the breasts, big in the butt, young enough for pickaninnies? How much? How much? $500. $500 once. $500 twice. $500 thrice. Sold to the gentleman in the cotton suit. Bit him in, bit him in. Let's try it again. I come to these auction blocks years after the crime. Screams and moans come each night with the stars. Black ghosts roam these pirated streets. Here is a child, here a child was torn away from his mother's arms. Here a brother was whipped to death. Because he wouldn't bow. He wouldn't bow. Oh, here pain roared like a hurricane. Oh, here pain roared like a hurricane. Blood and flesh are in these blocks. Blood and flesh are in these blocks. Black ghosts haunt this marketplace in these modern times. We cannot forget the crimes. <coughs> Let not this island beauty fool you, make you think you are in paradise. No. This blue water, these pungent flowers, this azure sky, these pastel homes, hill stacked, these brown, black, yellow folk dwell in history's museum. Listen to the wind. It wails the tail. It wails the tail. Broken bones have never mended. The thunder is the drum. Come, whirlwinds. Come with your song of steel. Um, in case you didn't know or don't speak French, but the name Lamont means mountain, the mountain. This poem is called Mountains. The sentences of mountains are endless, looped in the day's dying light. No one owns us, they say, in spite of leases and deeds. We outlast such things, they whisper, and those that would create such documents. We have stopped in our motion because we can. Read the geology of our pages. Eons ago, we silenced our roar. Clouds mimic our paragraphs. The serpent knows us well. Fear us, for we shall move again. Run for your lives when we speak. Um. I really feel honored to, um, to be in this special issue. One, because I'm a seven. I'm a seven. If you know anything about numerology, I'm a seven. Um, so it's, it was really important for me to make it into this issue, and I want to thank Sean for that. Um, this poem, Red Removal. The lack of red in the American landscape is an awesome absence. Who are these white folks in boots and hats, belts and spurs, tottering on the earth. 
Where are the snake people? The owl people? The crow people? The coyote people? The bear people? The buffalo people? The rain people? The fire people? The tree people? Behind wet door? Enclosed by wet desert? Shut up by wire? Vanished by distance? The lack of red is a loud music? A scream? A dying animal cry? An auto crash of sky? The lack of red, so many dead. All over the Americas, a people aborted, removed, cut back like weeds to make way for machines, ranches, farms, skyscrapers, super, super highways, pathways to oblivion. From the, from the magazine, um, the language I know. Uh, I was always fascinated by thunder and lightning. Um, my mother, who's on the cover of this book, um, whenever it thundered and lightning in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, she would insist that all everything electrical had to be turned off. And she said, that is God walking around outside. Have respect. The language I know. I belong to the TP nomadic red nations roaming the prairie of history. I belong to the makers of arrowheads, the chewers of buffalo hides. I belong to moccasins, war paint, eagle feathers, and stomp dancers. I belong to nations of dreamers, medicine men, and shamans. I belong to warriors and high cheekbone maidens. I belong to smoke signals, tomahawks, sweat lodges, and vision quests. I belong to Mother Earth, Father Sky, the rolling thunders of yesterdays. I walk a landscape of rainbows and loincloth and dreaming, thunder and lightning, the language I know. And I'll read one more poem and just um, tell you, you know, George Washington, when he was at Valley Forge, he was about to throw in the towel. He was about to just give up to the British. And he had a vision. And in this vision, a Native American chief that he had fought against in the French and Indian Wars appeared to him and showed him the future America. And he saw the, first, he saw the black president. Now, a lot of people want to say Barack is the first black president, but he's actually number seven, but that's another story. But he showed George Washington the future America. And George Washington continued to stay the course in terms of the revolution. Um, I was flying back from out west um, one day, and this poem came to me. Um, it's called "Winging Home," and I this was probably this was written in 2006, and it's probably the last time I was on an airplane inside the country because I don't fly inside this country. Um, but it's called Winging Home. Winging home over the American Southwest, the clouds thousands of feet below exploding in light. There is no thunder, only the photo flash of cosmic energy. I think of the vanished red nations whose footsteps bless the sacred earth, now ascended, stomp dancing in the air. Magnificent eagles soaring among their prayers. Thank you. <laughs>